Hello everyone. Uh, my name's Ian and um, I'm a studio supervisor at NSU Creative. We're a studio based in Leicester in the UK. And um, I've been in the industry for just over 12 years. And um, during this presentation, I'm going to be talking about some of the ways I'm using Houdini with ZBrush and Substance 3D. So I'm going to break down a couple of different example projects that I've set up. The first will be a set of modular rock sculpts. So I'm using Houdini to take my kind of early work in progress ZBrush sculpts, um, process them, reduce the poly count in Houdini, and then quickly export them to Unreal. And then I'll move on to using Houdini to generate uh, the low poly UV model for baking in Painter. And then I'm using Houdini in a way where I can quickly iterate backwards and forwards between the software packages. And then I've got a second example, which will be a larger cliff asset. So in this one, I'm going to be taking, again, sculpting in ZBrush and then using displacement maps, which are created in Designer to tile them across the ZBrush sculpt, displace the geometry inside Houdini, and then export a optimized version to Unreal. So before I go on to those, I want to talk a little bit more about NSC Creative and, and the kind of work that we do. So NSC Creative, said we're a UK studio when we specialize in creating immersive content for VR, for full dome, planetariums, as well as science centers, museums, and theme parks. Uh, we're actually based at the National Space Center, which is a nonprofit educational science center. So 20 years ago, when the Space Center first opened, NSU Creative was just a handful of freelance artists hired to create the Space Center's first planetarium show. Um, but since then, we've gone on to take on a wide variety of kind of international clients. So a couple of our recent client projects include a 45 minute full dome show for Pink Floyd to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the dark side of the moon. So that's released just this month. And then early in the year was the launch of Mission Ferrari at Ferrari World in Abu Dhabi. And that's um, Mission Ferrari is a theme park ride, a roller coaster that mixes kind of in parts of uh, a dark ride, elements of a dark ride. So we created content for both the queuing experience as well as the ride itself. And um, that was like a, an immersive tunnel, projection mapping, um, kind of projected set extensions and media that was synced to the ride motion, as well as to kind of physical practical effects on the ride as well. And then a little close to home, we recently launched at the Space Center Techstar Spaceport. So this is um, an educational mission experience for school groups and for public. It's, it's kind of mixes elements of immersive theater with live actors, sets, elements of theme park rides and a kind of educational escape room. So it takes the um, audience on a trip to Mars. They bought this, which is a real time motion seat ride, which we built in Unity. Um, so it's running in real time and we are projection mapping this onto a surface behind like this physical set, this physical window of a spaceship. And then during the experience, um, the audience can interact with it or with buttons on their seats and depend, they need to work together to kind of dodge these obstacles along the path. And depending on whether they succeed or fail at dodging, um, it feeds motion to the seats in real time and the motion seats react. So you have to work together to make it to the Mars base. And then for the full kind of, it's a 45 minute, experience where school groups uh, split into teams on the Mars base and they kind of take on job roles and almost like work experience aboard a Mars base where they learn about what it would take to live on Mars and um, learn about Mars's geological history, its atmosphere, and um, kind of ends with them boarding an escape pod to make it safely back to Earth. So that's just a couple of the kind of professional projects I've been involved in. Um, and then I'm just going to talk about some of the kind of personal projects that I've done where I've been using uh, Houdini with Unreal Engine. So over the last couple of years, I've been working on these personal projects where I've been slowly incorporating Houdini more and more into my workflow. So at the beginning of last year, I completed an art mentorship in um, which I did this project. And then I also took part in last year's Art Station Challenge, creating this stylized environment. And I also um, kind of towards the end of 2022 made a kind of Resident Evil 7 inspired hallway, which is this one here. Um, and for each of these projects, I've been incorporating Houdini in different ways to 
either create digital assets for use inside Houdini or building networks inside it, directly inside Houdini to um, kind of create assets non-destructively. Um, so using setups in a way that I can easily create variations or go back and make changes without having to redo subsequent parts of the pipeline manually. And so using Houdini in this way is like a huge time saver, taking care of repetitive parts of my workflow and giving me more time to focus on the creative process. The art mentorship I did was with Skilltree um, and my mentor on the project was Alex Beddoes, who's senior environment artist at Respawn. Uh, the project was completed over about seven to eight weeks. Uh, with each, each week, we'd have a, a phone call where he'll give me feedback. And something that Alex really impressed on me was the need to try and level up my artwork uniformly week on week. Um, so that kind of each, in a single week, I was doing a full iteration of my environment, going from block out and then doing a full pass, maybe as a rough sculpt pass in ZBrush, and then the following weeks trying to do a full pass with low poly UVs and baking. So I needed a workflow that allowed me to iterate quickly so that in a single week, I could step up all my assets to the next stage of production. So that's kind of the workflow that I'm going to break down. Um, going from block out, sculpting in ZBrush, and then kind of getting it into Unreal. So I've blocked out this example environment, which is what I'm going to use to, to kind of go through that workflow. So I begin by, so I've blocked out these kind of modular rocks that I'm going to fit together to make this rock formation. And then in the background, I've got some, some larger cliff assets. So begin by taking this into ZBrush uh, and just begin to block out the kind of overall scale and shape of my rocks and just begin to kind of define the kind of overall look that I'm going for. Think about how they might fit together modularly. And I do a rough pass to each one of these rocks, um, kind of as quickly as possible. And then I want to get them into Unreal at as early a stage as possible. So I can then use that as a point a reference to review them and then continue to iterate backwards and forwards between ZBrush and Unreal. Um, so I use GoZ to export my subtools from ZBrush. So these are exporting in the GoZ file format and, and naming those files the same name as the uh, name of the subtools. So then in Houdini, I kind of just begin with set up this simple network just to uh, import my uh, subtools. And you, there are some Gozi specific nodes that comes with side effects labs, um, but I've been using the, the standard kind of file file node uh, because I can use these with expressions. So using expressions help me keep the network a lot more dynamic and flexible. So for instance, I'm using an expression here which returns the name of the network. So which is an example is rock large zero one. So that's the name of the network and the name of the subtool that I've exported. So working this way means that I can update the name of the network and that will update the GoZ file that's being imported. And so further on, when I um, come to work on my other subtools, I can very easily duplicate this network, rename it and, and reuse it for all of my other subtools. So now I have a match size node. So this is using, um, this is centering the geometry to the center of the world. So that's centering the, the pivot point to the center of my object. Uh, and the match size node I use continuously to, to pos dynamically position the pivot point. So it can be used to justify the pivot. So it's always at the bottom of the geometry if it's something I want to easily snap to the ground or to the kind of bottom, bottom hand corner if I want to, for instance, a set of modular walls that I always want to have a consistent um, position of the pivot point, kind of asset to asset. Um, and then I'm using the poly reduce node to kind of just optimize my sculpts and lower the poly count and make them a bit more lightweight for exporting to Unreal. So at this stage, I'm just not worrying about creating a low poly for baking. It's just one that's a bit more lightweight for reviewing in Unreal as I'm still kind of um, sculpting my rocks. So I reduce the poly count and then I have a divide node just to triangulate the geometry before I export it. A normal node to generate some vertex normals 
and an attribute delete to um, remove any unnecessary attributes. So for instance, if I've accidentally applied some poly paint inside of ZBrush, that would come through as an as a attribute. And I don't want that going into Unreal and potentially causing any issues. So it's just a good habit to get into of just deleting any unnecessary attributes that I no longer need. And then I have the FBX output node, again, using expressions um, in place of the file name. So that again, when I come to it later, when I duplicate the network and reuse it, it will update. When I rename the network, it will update. And both the name of the subtool it's loading in and the name of the FBX that it's exporting. And it also really helps me keep a consistent naming convention right through from ZBrush through Houdini and into Unreal, um, because the expression is kind of handling the file naming for me. I haven't got to, I'm not going to accidentally misname something um, by working in this way. And then just a note uh, to check convert units. So um, Houdini one unit is equal to one meter, whereas Unreal is one unit is one centimeter. So checking this ensures that when I bring the mesh into Unreal, it's going to be the correct scale. And then I can click Save the Disk to export the FBX from Houdini. So in Unreal, I've set up Auto Import to, um, so Unreal's monitoring the folder that I'm exporting my FBX files to, and then automatically importing them into Unreal. Um, and when I come to make changes, any updates will automatically appear within Unreal. So I can begin to replace my block out and bring in my first rock. And then I can repeat that process for my remaining subtools. So I'm just exporting each one of these, again, using Go Z. And then because I'm using the expression, I can, here's where I begin to just duplicate the networks. And Houdini's automatically importing the matching subtool, um, centering the pivot point, deleting those NSU attributes, and doing that all for me. I just need to kind of rename these networks and just click Save to Disk on each of the individual networks to export them. And then with them exported, I can just begin to replace the rest of my block out. So as I bring them into the scene and remove the block out, I can now begin to review these sculpts in Unreal um, at this kind of work in, early work in progress stage and just begin to think about how I, want, why, how I might want to refine these sculpts uh, back in ZBrush. So now I can continue refining my rock sculpts um, yeah, in ZBrush. Yeah, so I'm using Dynamesh here, so I can make quite big drastic changes and add additional shapes and details as needed uh, based on the, the feedback that I've seen in Unreal. Um, and over in Houdini, I've got uh, my setup. So I can easily just, in a couple of clicks, I can click Reload Geometry and then Save to Disk on the Output node. And I can then get those updates into Unreal in just a couple of clicks. So I repeat this process for, for you know, a large portion of the work in progress process whilst I'm in ZBrush, kind of continually reviewing my assets in Unreal and um, making informed decisions about how I want to move my sculpts forward and be confident that you know, what I'm producing is working together modularly and I'm not kind of blindly doing it in ZBrush without, without reviewing it in Unreal. Um, and even work by setting up a concept art in the viewport inside Unreal so that I can kind of over in ZBrush push and pull shapes to match the concept and just kind of quickly export back and forth between ZBrush and Unreal. So I keep working in this in this way until I'm kind of ready to move on to the next stage of production, which would be to begin texturing my rocks. So once I've started adding kind of a higher level of detail, I want to begin uh, baking that detail again to check that, so I can kind of review it, check that the details I'm adding are kind of appearing as I'm expecting once they're baked, that they're holding up in the resolution that I'm intending to use so that I can be confident that the details I'm adding in ZBrush um, will all work once I get to the baked texture. So this is kind of a few hours on when I've begun to um, 
add that higher level of detail, I'm happy with the kind of overall shapes that I've I'm, I'm been reviewing inside of Unreal. And then I can uh, move into Houdini. So here, this is the same network I had before, but I've just begun to progress it a little more and added a few additional nodes. So I'm importing the GoZ file as I did before. And then before, before I come on to creating the low poly mesh, I want to do a little bit of cleanup. So with um, when decimating or poly reducing the, the high poly model, if you've got quite a lot of um, kind of high frequency noise or um, these kind of specific like kind of concave shapes like these cracks, when you do the poly reduction, it's reducing the poly count so much that it's not really retaining those, those details very well. And I'd actually rather remove those from the high poly before I do the um, kind of poly reduction process and just kind of keep those details baked into the normal map. And what I would usually do if I was in uh, ZBrush is take the smooth brush and smooth out those details um, to kind of remove them. And then when I do the decimation in ZBrush, I get a cleaner result. But the trouble with that is it's, an, it's destructive. So if I wanted to then make a change, I'd have to go back, undo those changes, make my amendments, and then redo that process. So I wanted a more non-destructive way of doing that inside Houdini. So the solution I found was to use the attribute paint node. So here I'm just painting a mask kind of across those details. And then I can reference that attribute inside an attribute blur. And then as I increase the, the blur iterations, that will smooth out those details and remove them from the high poly model. So then when I move on to doing the poly reduction, I kind of get a much cleaner result. And so when I bake those details, they won't kind of be in the low poly, they can just be kept in, in the baked normal map. So with the advantage of using the attribute paint node is if I come back to uh, ZBrush and I make a change, particularly if I'm using DynaMesh, I'm changing the number of polygons and, and vertices. So when I initially reload the geometry, that attribute paint kind of breaks, but I can come onto it and click recast strokes and that will reapply the same brush strokes I had previously. So it's far less um, destructive. And I can, have, can continue to refine that, that um, painted mask if I need to. And then for the low poly, um, I'd like to try and break this down into a few different steps. So I've got the first initial poly reduce node uh, just to kind of reduce it to a more manageable level. And then I'm using the curvature node, the measure curvature node from SideFX Labs to generate a kind of mask along the edges of my geometry. So I can then use this uh, as a kind of mask inside the poly reduction to retain the polygon density along those edges and just reduce it kind of in the center areas. So this is kind of helping me better maintain the overall silhouette of the object um, whilst reducing that poly count where it's, where it's not needed. And I kind of I can adjust the weight of how much um, poly reduce kind of use the influence of that mask to uh, drive the poly reduction. And then I just have a kind of final uh, poly reduce node just to fine tune the end result and more uniformly reduce the poly count if I need to. And then I have the auto UV node from SideFX Labs. So at this stage. I'm just trying to get something as quickly as I can from ZBrush into Painter. So I just use the Auto UV node to generate some UVs quickly. And I just choose kind of whichever method gives me the cleanest results. And I can merge together some of the smaller UV islands to um, tidy up if I need to. And then I can always come back and create a, um, a manual set of UVs, kind of unwrapping it manually if I need to, kind of further down the line when I know I'm not going to need to make uh, as many changes. And then I'm still got like, those, those same nodes as before, the, the triangulate and then the attribute, uh, the normal node to generate some vertex normals and an attribute delete, again, just to delete and necessary attributes. So for instance, the um, convexity attribute and the mask that I painted, I can remove those because they're no longer needed. And then I have here two um, name nodes. So these are creating two uh, attributes. 
One's called name, which is the name of the geometry, so the name of the rock. And then a second uh, primitive attribute called shop material path. And so when I move into painter, these translate to the best name. So in painter, for instance, when I'm baking the amulet occlusion, I can specify to bake by mesh name. And so that will ensure that any shadowing from one object won't be cast onto another. And so a painter will bake these as individual objects and will match their names. And then the material path attribute is the name of the texture sets. So in the top right, you can see I've got four texture sets. So one for each of my large rocks, and then I've grouped together the um, kind of medium rocks onto a single texture set. Um, I'll move on to a second. I've got a second kind of painter network, which I've set up where I'll group these uh, meshes together to export them to painter. And in that network, I will um, pack their, those kind of these medium rocks, their UVs together and apply that unique uh, material path attribute. Um, but before that, I'll just export these to Unreal. So I've got my match size node again to center the pivot and the FBX to export it, the mesh to Unreal. And then over here is where I've got that kind of second um, network for exporting my meshes to Painter. So here I'm just merging in my uh, rocks to together so I can export them as a, a single high poly FBX and a single one for my low poly. Um, I'm merging them in um, using the object merge node and to reference kind of each from each of the networks. Um, I specified this, this path, so it's rock underscore asterisk and the asterisk is kind of acting as a wild card. So it's essentially referencing any network that can, contains the word rock in it. So that's each of my uh, individual networks. And then um, I'm referencing a node called a, a high. So that's just a, um, a null, sorry, at the beginning of each one of my networks. So it's this object merge essentially just merges in every single one of my high poly sculpts from that position in the network uh, into this graph. And then I can export them from here to, uh, to Painter. So also note to just specify that name attribute as well in, in um, on the file node. So that will ensure that when you export it, it will use that name attribute to name the, each of the individual objects. And then on the right here, I'm, this is where I'm splitting off the three medium rocks. And then I'm using a UV layout node to pack those UVs together so they're no longer overlapping. And then I've also checked the, there's an option to um, scale each of the islands to match their surface area. So that will ensure they, they have an, um, an even texture density between each of the rocks. And after that, I have a name attribute, sorry, name node to create that material path attribute so that these medium rocks now have a single, uh, will have a single texture set when I bring them into Painter. And then I can merge them together and export them to Painter. So here I've already um, imported my low poly. I've baked my mesh maps from the high poly and I can apply a smart material to procedurally texture the rocks. So I like to use for as large portion of projects as I can, procedural textures, whenever I'm still switching back and forth between ZBrush and um, Painter, I want something that can update quickly, I'm going to manually paint any um, like hand painted textures at this stage. And then once I'm happy with the, the details I'm adding, I can always come back and, and do a manual pass um, further into production. Uh, so then with that set up, I can now kind of iterate backwards and forwards um, between ZBrush and Painter. So here I'll just quickly kind of stamp on a few extra details just to um, show that, that easy process of switching you know, between Houdini and Painter. So with those details added, I can hit Gozi to export the uh, subtool. And then in Houdini, I can just simply reload the geometry and then switch to my Painter graph to uh, export the updated low poly and um, high poly mesh. 
So kind of in a couple of clicks, uh, Houdini's generated the updated low poly and um, updated the UVs, centered the pivot and done, done all those kind of things. And uh, I can then very quickly get those details, get those updated details into Painter. So I just re-import the low poly, rebake my mesh maps, and then uh, the procedural texture will up update to reflect those changes. So much as I did before with working in ZBrush between kind of ZBrush and Unreal, um, when I'm you know kind of work in progress, I can uh, when I'm working progress on my ZBrush sculpts, so I can easily flip backwards and forwards between uh, ZBrush and Painter and kind of continually review that the details I'm adding are holding up when I'm um, making them. So I use this workflow a lot for um, any kind of small medium assets that I can sculpt in ZBrush. But then for a larger asset, such as these cliffs, um, I'm going to be using, uh, again, sculpting in ZBrush and then painting a, a, a mask using polypaint to then blend between um, some displacement maps. So the uh, sculpt on the left is kind of what I'm starting with. It's kind of just the um, like kind of the broad overall shapes of the cliff. And then I'm using the displacement maps to add a finer level of detail. So the two materials are made in uh, Designer. And then I'm going to blend those together to uh, displace the geometry. So I've used polypaint here to paint in a mask. And it's this mask that I'll use to uh, blend those two displacement maps together. Um, you could perhaps make this, generate this mask inside Houdini um, either procedurally or maybe use the attribute um, uh, paint node to paint in a mask, but uh, using polypaint here with it's kind of a bit more easier to smooth out the uh, blends and um, adjust it as I, as I need to. Um, so I continue with GoZ exporting the geometry to Houdini. So I'll um, begin by using a transform node just to scale down the geometry to kind of match the, the scale that I want it to be in, uh, in Unreal. And then I have a match size node again, but this time I'm using it to position the geometry so it's uh, just slightly recessed into the ground. Uh, because uh, what I'll do is I'll actually just clip off the bottom and the back of the geometry. So these, these areas that the player's not going to see that I don't need, I can clip those off uh, to remove them, and then use the uh, attribute, the delete small parts node from side effects lab. So I'm using that to kind of just retain the largest piece of geometry. So if I, uh, in some cases, I find that when I was clipping off the geometry, I'd leave behind like small bits of kind of orphaned geometry, which I want to delete. So this kind of just grabs that one big piece and removes any other kind of left behind piece of geometry that I no longer need. And then before I displace the geometry, I need to generate some, some UVs on this, uh, this sculpt. So because it's quite high poly, and then I'm taking it and subdividing it further um, to optimize the UVing process, I actually create a proxy version of the cliff. So I'm using the poly reduce node just to reduce the poly count. And then I'll generate the UVs on this, and then I can transfer them to the high poly. So this just helps speed up the kind of UVing process and makes it a little more uh, lightweight. So using the polyreducer node again, just to kind of optimize the geometry and create this kind of proxy version. And then I have the UV flatten, which is unwrapping the, uh, the cliff. So it's one large island, but I'm getting this uh, distortion across the cliff. So this kind of bending and warping, I want to re remove it so that when I displace the geometry, all the details would be kind of nice and horizontal across the full uh, width of the cliff. So to do that, I can create um, a set of vertex groups, which I can reference inside the UV flatten node. Uh, and then those vertex groups will be aligned to the U axis and that will uh, remove that distortion. Uh, and so to create those uh, vertex groups, I'm using the group nodes and um, specifying a bounding box and then 
any vertex groups within these bounding boxes will be added to the group. So to kind of define the position and the uh, size of those bounding boxes, I'm using some expressions. So again, using expressions to um, automate the process of selecting these vertices so that when I make changes, uh, they're not selections I have to set um, kind of redo manually. Um, so I'm using the centroid expression to, uh, in this example, return the, the central position of the uh, box. And so as I change the box, that um, expression updates and I can always kind of grab that center line. And then I'm using the um, binding box expression to set the size of the box. So it all match, always matches the um, kind of full width and depth of the object. And then I can use these expressions I've actually got a couple of clip nodes to kind of slice through the geometry and give me a clean line of vertices to select. And then I can um, use those expressions to create these kind of uh, vertex groups, one at the um, bottom, one at the middle, and then another one kind of three quarters of the way up. And when I reference these uh, groups inside of the UV flatten, I can um, align those uh, vertex selections to the U axis on the UVs and then that will remove that distortion. So yeah, I get a much cleaner result as a, once I've added those groups. And then here I'm just scaling up the UV, so I want to tile the displacement several times across the cliff. Um, so I tile, the, I tile it here, and then further on down the network, I'll actually scale it back down again, so it will be back between a value of 0 to 1. And then what I'll do is when I'm in Unreal, I will tile my textures to, to match the um, number of times that I'm tiling it here. So now that I've got these UVs, I can uh, transfer them to my subdivided geometry. And now I've got these UVs on that high poly and I'm ready to move on to uh, the displacement. So I'll be displacing the geometry inside a uh, point VOP. So before I do that, I need to transfer my UVs from vertices to points. So then I'll be able to reference them uh, inside the point VOP. And I still have that uh, color attribute, which I painted inside of ZBrush. And then I'll be using this to blend between the uh, two displacement maps inside the point VOP. So this is the end res result. Um, so this is two different displacement maps being uh, blended together using this uh, network. So uh, just to kind of go through this briefly, the, the bottom here, I'm bringing in that color attribute and then loading in my two displacement textures and then mixing them together using that, uh, that color attribute as a mask. And then to uh, better retain the uh, overall shape of the cliff, I'm just remapping the displace displacement values from a value of 0 to 1 to values of uh, minus 1 to 1. So by doing that, I'll be displacing the geometry not just kind of positively, but also negatively. So um, that will stop it from kind of looking like it's kind of ballooning out um, and will better retain the uh, shapes of the initial rock sculpt. And then I can displace the geometry using a node called displace along normals. So um, I can scale up the displacement and I can promote that attribute. So that will promote that parameter so I can adjust it from the uh, point VOP. So kind of with that set and done, but I'm got a few issues with this displacement. So on some of the concave areas, it's kind of intersecting. And also on the, um, it's displacing in the Y direction as well. So underneath it's kind of buckling. And then on the top, it's a little bit odd having it displaced in these, these areas on top. So to kind of refine the displacement and get a bit more of a, a result I'm happy with, I can manipulate the normals prior to the displacement and then uh, kind of adjust how the uh, displacement is occurring. So I'm creating some uh, point normals here, and then 
I can reference the normals inside an attribute blur. So as I visualize the normals, you can see this is where they're intersecting. But then as I blur out the, um, the normal attributes, it kind of averages out the overall direction. So now when I displace the geometry, they'll have removed that intersection and it'll be kind of be more displacing in a more even average direction. And then I use kind of a similar process for removing the display, or rather reducing the displacement in the y direction. So I have um, an attribute adjustment node. And what I'll do is I'll reference just the y channel of the normals. So just the displacement in the y axis up and down. And then I can multiply that by a value. Um, so yeah, I'm referencing just the y direction. And as I, as I reduce this value, it kind of flattens out the normal. So they're no longer being displaced upwardly, just kind of outward in the x and z uh, horizontally. So this just helps me kind of fine tune how the, the displacement is being applied and, and removing any potential issues of intersection. So with the geometry displaced, this is kind of my, my high poly. And then I can do my poly reduce to uh, optimize the geometry and then generate some corrected vertex normals. And then here is where I'm um, scaling those UVs back down. So they're back between a value of zero to one on the UVs. And then I'll, I'll apply the uh, matching tiling inside Unreal. So I'm just exporting them again with an FBX node to export them to Unreal, but then I need to actually bake out this, uh, this color attribute to a mask, to a map, so that I can use that inside of Unreal. So I'm doing that using the simple baker. I just need to, um, oops, just skipped over that, but uh, if I get back here. So yeah, so I'm actually taking that uh, color attributes and just uh, taking the red channel and adding it to a float called mask so that I can reference that float inside the simple baker node. So I'm referencing it at the bottom there and then I can just bake out this as a relatively low mask, low resolution map. Because it's quite a kind of smooth out mask. It doesn't need too much detail. So when I move into Unreal, um, so I've imported my mesh and applied the material that I'm going to use. Uh, here is the baked map from uh, Houdini that I've just baked out. And I'm using this to blend between my two kind of materials, my two sets of textures. And then when I tile this, it will match the displacement that I've just applied in Houdini. So kind of working in this way allows me to kind of create larger assets that need to use tiling textures to cover a large area. But by blending them together, I can hide any kind of repetition. Uh, and I can kind of create these very large assets that need to cover kind of a broad, a broad area. And because I'm working in a way that's uh, non-destructive for any part of this, if I go back to ZBrush and make a change, I can quickly get those through that same pipeline without kind of making any manual updates or go back to designer and, and refine the displacement um, and uh, easily make these updates. And also because I'm using expressions, I can easily, again, duplicate the network to create uh, additional variations. So I've got my kind of a much larger cliff and a slightly smaller cliff here. Um, and I'll do the same as I did before. I can duplicate this network, rename it. And because I'm using expressions for handling the um, the naming of the file that I'm importing and saving, kind of based on the name of the network, I can, it automatically, automatically in, kind of imports that um, file that I've exported from ZBrush. And I can just kind of tweak the displacement or the number of times that I'm tiling the displacement. And then I've very quickly got an additional variation. So working in these ways, I can quickly make additional assets by just simply reusing the uh, same networks that I had before. So I'm exporting the FBX and I just need to bake the uh, individual map for the individual rocks uh, cliffs. 
And then once I've baked out their kind of individual maps, I can begin to bring these into Unreal. So here I've got, again, some additional variations uh, made very quickly by reusing the same network. I can duplicate and reuse the same materials I had before. I just need to kind of update the tiling if needed and uh, apply their individual maps. And then I've got two more uh, cliff, ass cliff assets to, uh, to use. So just to wrap up, uh, working in this way with, with Houdini has allowed me to, um, to automate large portions of my pipeline between ZBrush and other software packages so that I can work non-destructively um, uh, so I can easily kind of go back and make changes by using expressions to handle the far naming or vertex, vertex selection as well as the naming of mesh and textures. So that allows me to iterate quickly backwards and forwards between uh, ZBrush and other software such as Unreal and Painter so that I can um, kind of review my assets in Unreal as I intend to use them um, often and quickly and then easily reuse the same networks uh, for additional variations. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I'm going to, when I get back from GDC, I'm going to try and share these files on my ArtStation page if anyone wants to download them and, and pick them apart. Um, and then if anybody has any questions, they can always email me or um, contact me on social media. I'm pretty much everywhere as Ian Smith Artist. Um, so yeah, thank you very much.